、えー、皆さんこんにちはアルファアドバイザーズの坂下です今日はかねてから申し上げていた通りアルファと、えー、デイシー・ブラックマン・コンサルティングというねアメリカでも非常に大きくかつ、まあ、最も MBA トップスクールに輩出している素晴らしいカウンセラーさんたちがたくさんいる会社さんなんですけれどもコラボレーションしてより多くの方特に M7、まあ、トップスクールを目指したい方向けに一緒にですねサポートをしていくことになりました。で今日は、えー、素晴らしいゲストの方が来ていただいているので、実際にどういう MBA のアプリケーションの準備をしていくのか、まあ、とてもベーシックなところになると思うんですけれども、まずはお話しいただこうと思っております。でえっと、メインは英語のセッションになりますけれども、日本語でも構いませんので、コメントとか質問があれば、どんどん入れていただければと思います。So,、uh, we are our five advisors and we are teaming up with Stacy Blackman Consulting, which is a top MBA consulting firm.、They've, uh, they have a team with ex MBA admissions from Harvard, Stanford, and such top schools. And of course, they are all MBA grads themselves. Today, we have A great guest from Stacy Blackman Consulting, Salar, and we're going to go over how to actually get into your dream school, M7,、uh, such a such top MBA schools, and addressing key components such as testing and extra curriculars. And we have some QA session with you at the end of this webinar. So if free, please feel free to post your. Question and comments in the comment section、uh, in our YouTube channel. So, Sawar, thank you for joining us today. I'm very excited to have this great opportunity. Thank you. We're so excited to be partnering with you and hope that we can give some great information to everybody on your channel. All right.、Um, Today, my hope is to just talk to everybody a little bit about what to do now that it's January, the new year. Applications seem like they're far away, but really it's only about nine months until the first round of deadlines. What can you do with this time?、Um, that's kind of how we're going to use our time today to get your juices flowing, to think about key. Things that are still very much within your control as you plan for the next few months. So, to start,、um, I just wanted to introduce myself a little bit. As Sakashita san said, my name is Sarah. I am one of the principals with Stacey Blackman Consulting. I have personally, I graduated from Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management. I've been working with Stacey Blackman Consulting for about 20 years now. And actually, Stacey Blackman and I were classmates at Kellogg and have known each other since high school. So it's been a long time that we've been working together. And prior to business school, I lived in Tokyo for five years.、Uh, I worked for Sony Corporation prior to getting my MBA. I wanted to spend the time today talking a little bit about admissions process in general and the advantage that you have. The key advantage that you have right now, oh, I'm sorry, can you move to the next slide? Thank you.、Um, one of the key advantages you have right now is really to think more broadly about what the admissions process is for. These top business schools are trying to get a sense for your potential to be an impactful leader in the future. There are many things that go into being a strong leader, as we all know. It's not just about your grades and your test scores, but it's really about your overall experience and. Differentiating from amongst the people that come from the same industry, the same function, and sometimes the same company as you. So, one of the things you can do over the next few months is to really think about how you might use this time to think about the ways in which you're different from your peers. In 
in thinking about this, there's sort of several different areas that I'm going to spend some time going into. Your candidacy has several components. The obvious one will be your job, your career progression. What can we do over the next six months to really improve in this area? The second one that may be on many of your minds is the test. What are the different tests? How do I know which test to take? The third category would be your extracurricular involvements, thinking about your goal. And then we'll touch a little bit just on your own personal assessment. What are your strengths and weaknesses? And again, is there something you can do about that over the next six to nine months? So the first bucket is career progression. Now is a great time to think about where you are in your company. So next slide, please. Yeah, now is, the, right. So think about, are you coming up on that time for a promotion at the end of this year? Do you have a mid-year review coming up? You should ask for some feedback from your boss or close colleagues. Are there ways that you might be able to step up and push yourself a little bit professionally. If you're in a flat organization, that's okay. You don't have to have a change in your title. Really what we're looking for is your slope. What is the change over time in your responsibilities? Is there a way for you to push, get a little bit more responsibility, offer to give a little bit more free time within your company? These are things that are very much within your control and can help you to stand out. The second thing is around testing, big thing. And particularly right now, as many people know, the GMAT just released a new test called the GMAT Focus. So you have the GMAT Focus, you have the GRE, which has also recently been changed. And then you have the EA, three different exams. How do I know which one to take? Well, the answer is that it doesn't matter the schools will accept either the GMAT or the GRE very openly. There's no truth to some of the things you read online about one secretly being better than the other. The schools want you to take the one that will enable you to show your best self. The new GMAT focus is just rolling out now and is the only option starting February 1 of this year. There's no more old GMAT. This test is going to be shorter than the old GMAT, so that's great news. It's going to be about two hours and 15 minutes long. And likewise, the new GRE is also two hours. So the test is adapting to be easier on you, hopefully. In the case of the GRE, the exam is the same as in the old format. Topics are the same, but there are fewer questions per topic. While the GMAT focus has decided to eliminate geometry and eliminate the sentence correction. So hopefully that makes you feel happy and will enable you to study for the exam most effectively. My advice would be to take a sample exam for both. See which one you like better. See if there's one that feels easier or maybe even if you don't do so well now, you recognize everything and you feel confident that with some studying, this exam will be more attainable for you. If possible, try to think about the testing to get your first test done by the spring, March, April. This is a great time to get the testing done before you turn your attention to the essay writing and all of the other real application work. Within this, the score itself, don't worry so much about the total. Don't worry about this idea that a 730 on the GMAT is important. The new GMAT focus has a very different scale. The scores are all going to be different. We're not quite sure where the threshold will be yet. So really just focus on doing your best. As a school, they're more concerned with the subsection scores. What is your quantitative score? What is your verbal score? We'd like for them to be equal. The quantitative score 
is a little bit more important in the sense that we can't give you a math test in an interview, but we can assess your verbal score in an interview. So think about that as you take the test. Don't be afraid to take it several times. Schools very much appreciate people who try. And if you don't do your best the first time, that you try again. That shows work ethic. That shows growth. That shows commitment to attending a top business school. So don't worry about it being looked down upon. Retesting is fine. Okay, the next big topic is extracurriculars. Extracurriculars is very difficult because a lot of people don't really know what an extracurricular means and what counts as an extracurricular. Well, the truth is that anything counts. Everything is wonderful. As a business school, we want to learn what kind of a leader you're going to be. It's not just about your academic intellect, but it's also about what kind of person are you? When you are a leader, what kind of a role model will you be? Extracurriculars are a way for these schools to get a sense for what interests you have outside of the workplace. It's a way for them to understand whether or not you're a strong multitasker. It's a way for them sometimes to learn about skill sets that you're not demonstrating at work. So think about how you're using your time outside of work and what that might say about your personality and your passions and try to use it that way. I would say it's not important that you're involved in three or four or five things. It's not about the number of activities, but it's about the impact you're having. If you've been involved in one activity, but you've done it for four years, that shows me that you're loyal. It shows me that you're passionate about this cause. And it shows me how you're able to grow and make a difference to this organization over time. Consistency is wonderful. Title, as I, as I will say many times, is not as important as impact. If you're in a job that's very analytical, consider getting involved in an extracurricular that allows you to be more creative. How can you use this activity to show the school, again, a different skill set? If you're in a marketing job and you don't have very strong math skills in undergrad, perhaps get involved in an organization and volunteer to be on the finance committee, help to organize a fundraiser. If you are an engineer, maybe you can manage a social media campaign for a nonprofit. There are lots of ways you can use these extracurriculars to show your various interests as well as your various skill sets. If you're not involved in anything right now, don't worry. Getting involved now is great. Again, schools appreciate the effort. They appreciate that you are self-aware enough to know that you're a little light here and you're willing to work on it. Again, to show me your commitment to attending a top business school. So this is a great way to use the next nine months. Your goal, so a lot of business schools are gonna ask you whether in an essay or an interview, a lot of times people will ask, what is your goal? It's not really about the goal itself. So I don't want you to be afraid, oh, I'm not sure I want, I know what I want to do. For many people, business school is an opportunity to learn about new jobs, to learn about different types of industries and functions that you don't know about yet. And that's absolutely fine. What the schools are trying to assess is, are you able to clearly articulate a goal? Are you self-aware enough that you know, in order for me to get from point A to point B, here are the steps that I might take. Are you logical? Are you able to reflect on your own strengths and weaknesses? And do you have a plan? So focus on that process and less about the goal itself. If you know in your heart that you have something you're passionate about and you're hoping to go to business school to change careers, great. Think about, are there things that you can do in that extracurricular time in pursuit of your goal? If it's something that's very different than what you do today, does it require a license that you can go get? Or is there a nonprofit that does something similar that you could volunteer for? There are lots of ways to show thoughtfulness and that you're being proactive in thinking about the goal 
that is another wonderful thing to do over the next few months. If you know you want to be in a particular field and you don't really know what the path looks like, then I would say spend some time looking on LinkedIn or talking to colleagues in your company that maybe have already walked that path and learn a little bit more about the types of things they did that might help you to get some ideas. And then the last thing is weaknesses. And of course, hand in hand with that goes strengths, right? But spend some time maybe thinking about what am I good at? What do I know I'm really good at? And what are the areas that maybe I know I'm not as good at? If I have areas that I know I'm not as good at, what might I do to improve them? You don't need to solve a problem. It doesn't mean that the weakness has to disappear. Everybody has weaknesses. But maybe if you can make your weakness a little bit smaller or show that you are somebody who works on your weaknesses, again, that's a wonderful attribute. So some obvious things that I've noted here would be if you have a low GPA, if you struggled in college with certain classes, it may be a great time to go and take another class now to demonstrate academic readiness, to show that you are aware that your GPA is a little bit low and you are willing to do what it takes to show the school that you're ready today. There are, course, there are courses available in the US at schools like UCLA and Berkeley that are offered online. And these courses, there are courses that are offered specifically for people who are considering an MBA. That could be a great option for you, depending upon what your weakness is. If there are, if you have an extracurricular weakness, we've obviously covered that. If you feel that your, your job is not really going the way you want it to, then maybe you can set yourself a stretch goal or you can look for more leadership outside of work in order to compensate for a lack of leadership inside work. So I think if you can kind of do this exercise of really think, thinking through what are the ways in which I can control my weaknesses and strengthen them even just a little bit, that's a gift. Then that means that come next September, you're a better applicant than you are today. Okay, next is application components. So what I would say is, as you think about the big buckets of things you can work on, which I think we've covered, um, that's those are the things you can launch now. You can start working on extracurriculars now. You can look for professional opportunities now. You can certainly start studying for your standardized tests now. Then beyond that, some people are very eager to start thinking about the application itself. So next, I'm going to talk a little bit about what are the parts of the application that you can work on? And what are some ideas of things that maybe you, you can do a little bit more proactively? Okay, so you can think about your school selection. You can think about your resume. Certainly that's a living document, so we can always be working on that. We can start to think a little bit about recommend, recommenders and who appropriate people might be. And then I would say not... Lastly, we can think about essay questions, but I think you would only really do that once the other things are in, in process. Okay, so school selection. For many people, um, business school, you may have heard of only a few names out there. Everyone says, oh, I want to go to Harvard. Oh, I want to go to Stanford. But of course, there's many more outstanding schools beyond those. So now would be a great opportunity for you to start thinking about schools beyond the, the top schools. Do a little bit of thinking, not just about name, but about environment, culture. Are you hoping to be in a big city? Are you more comfortable in a smaller, more rural setting? Is it important to you to be in a very big class or do you prefer a smaller class? Is there something about your personality that you feel is really important and you want to look for classmates that will be similar? Start to think about those sorts of things. Often many schools will offer online and sometimes local in-person events introducing their school to you. Look into that and maybe 
sign up to attend a few. You're not looking really to learn about the curriculum or to study the types of classes that are offered because business school largely is finance and accounting and marketing and much of the curriculum is going to be the same. But what will differ will be the feel of the culture. What will differ might be very specific programs if you're interested in healthcare or you know if you want to get a joint JD MBA. So there are times when there are specific programs, but I think everybody should think about the kind of classmates you want to have. Talk to friends again, reach out to people that went to your college or people from your company that have attended business school and ask them, what did you think of your experience? What were the things about it that were unique and special and different? Take notes. If you attend an event that Columbia does, after the event, just reflect a little bit. What were you struck by? What did you really like about that school? And then later on, when you're writing your essay, you can go back and just remind yourself of some of those more unique parts of the school that will make your application much more personal. Okay, next is um, resume. Um, Emmy, I think we're ahead a couple of slides, sorry. Sorry. No, no problem. Okay, so resume. Everybody, most people have a resume that they've used for jobs. And a business school resume is a little bit different. There's no need right now to worry too much about this, but it is a good time to just start thinking and maybe taking some notes. A, a work resume tends to be very task oriented. If you're interviewing for a new job, the company naturally wants to know, what are you going to do for me? So you will have bullet points that say things like, I can build a spreadsheet. I have made a PowerPoint presentation. I can do a cash flow model. A business school, on the other hand, is not hiring you to build a model or to make a presentation. A business school is admitting you because of your potential to be an effective leader. And so you want to focus your resume a little bit more on skill sets. You're going to use action verbs that can be partnered with results. So rather than telling me that you assist somebody, um, you might tell me that you facilitated a meeting. Facilitating a meeting, you're not exaggerating if you're not leading the meeting, but you might be helping to facilitate. Facilitation is a word that implies that you have good communication skills. And that is a key value that we look for in future leaders. You want to think about using examples or bullet points that have a result. Don't tell me that you evaluated data without explaining what your evaluation led to. I want to know not just that you're doing your job every day, but I want to understand that you're doing a good job. One of the, the exercises that I like to have clients use is to say, if I were reading your resume, the specific part about this job, how would I know that you're doing a better job than the person that sits next to you at work? How would I know that you are doing a better job than the other people within your office? And if that isn't clear, then try to change your bullet points and put a little bit more of that result in it. It's not always possible, but it certainly should be possible most of the time. Really focus on impact. Also, when you're writing your resume for business school, remember that we don't necessarily know your company. If you tell me that you manage $1 million, I don't know if you work for a $1 billion company where $1 million is very small and not very meaningful at all. Or maybe you work for a $5 million company where a million dollars would be a very significant part of the business. Remember to include context. Help me to understand where you are so that my reaction can be, wow, this is great, instead of, hmm, I can't really tell. 
The last bullet point I have on this slide talks about real estate. You don't need to worry about this as much now, but when you're putting together a resume for business school, you want to remember that your choices are reflective of what you believe. So as an example, if your whole resume is about your job, that will imply to me that all that you care about is your job. So you really want to think about how does my resume reflect my values? I very much appreciate education. I really valued my time in undergrad. Is that reflected on my resume? Do I have just one line that says I graduated from college? Or am I giving a little bit of a sense for why I enjoyed college? What clubs were, was I involved in? What did I do outside of the classroom? This is a way that the business school begins to understand patterns of behavior. Oh, you've been involved in extracurriculars ever since you were in college. That's much more meaningful to me than, oh, you've been involved in extracurriculars just for the past one month. So you really want to begin to think about these things. For now, longer is better. Later on, you need to go through the process of editing. Your resume for business school will only be one page. For now, feel free to add in more because it's easy for us to guide you on what things to cut. But if we don't know that you did it, it's hard for us to ask you to include it. Okay, next is recommendation letters. Again, I would say this is not something that you need to be actively doing right now. It's much too early. But what you can be doing is thinking about the people in your life that, you know, maybe you'll be reaching out to sometime over the summer. Recommendations are not people with big titles, but it really is people that know you well. What we are going to guide you on later on is, how do I choose my recommender? How do I select from amongst the people that I work with? And the answer is going to be, it depends on the individual. Again, going back to an earlier example, if you are an engineer who is very, very analytically focused, then we might suggest that you choose a recommender who can speak to the fact that you are very warm and funny or that you are a really great collaborator in the office. Because that's not something that we would know just from reading your resume and is incredibly important as we think about your future as a leader. So right now you can just begin to think about all of the different people that you interact with and just start to keep some notes. You might reach out to them this spring or summer and ask for to have coffee or catch up by phone to keep them apprised of what you're doing now. And then later down the road, we can do more specific deciding about who that individual might be. That, that is pretty much it. I think those are the big topics that um, we wanted to go over today. I think the big overarching message is that you are starting early you have a lot of time and you really do have the opportunity to improve your candidacy now. It's great. Um, take advantage of it and see how much you can push yourself. And then when the time comes to really get involved in the application process itself, you'll have extra bonus material that perhaps your peers won't have. Thank you very much for a very clear explanation about the entire MBA application process. I think you can understand um, this is very crucial to get into top MBA uh, that uh, not submitting application documents solely, but to approach the very strategically recommend to select your recommenders and build your career and reflect on that. Uh, on, on resume about your work stuffs. So I want to uh, dive into some components that I received very often from the applicants. Uh, so the first one is, so about uh, career progression. So I, I have very, number of questions from the applicants or potential applicants about MBA itself. Uh, could you 
could you let us, could you share your experience, how MBA made your career progress or uh, how, how you can dive into your new industry or mm. career? So obviously this is very different for everybody. For me, I spent five years working at Sony. In my undergrad, I had a major in music. I didn't do anything business related at all. And I worked at Sony in product planning. I loved my job, but it was the only job I had. And I didn't know, did I love it because of this job or would I love every job? <laughs> so for me, going to business school was a way to get exposed to different kinds of jobs that I didn't know were out there. So business school for me, I think was a little different than people who come from a business background. I never had taken any classes in finance or accounting, strategy, human resource. All of it was very new for me. I took advantage of learning about all the different industries, many, many different companies by attending events on campus. Different companies would come to Kellogg and give us a presentation about what their company did or the consulting, all of the different consulting firms would come and give us an overview about what is consulting, you know, what is banking? And it gave me an opportunity to learn and think, could I imagine myself in this job or that job? For me, I used the MBA to change my career. I did my summer internship in consulting. And then like many people, I accepted a full-time offer after I graduated from business school and I loved it. I thought it was a really fantastic job for me. I knew from business school that I enjoyed thinking about big problems. I knew I enjoyed um, working on teams. I knew I enjoyed fast paced environments, but I didn't really know what necessarily that meant for a company. And consulting was a really great way for me to basically do all of the things that I knew I liked. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. So a uh, candidate can consult with the counselor about their career progression, what, it, what they should uh, go after the, the right after the graduation or what their career aspiration. A they candidate can, the can ask us? Yes, they, they can discuss. You yes. Yes. We spend a lot of time with our clients talking about some people come to us and they say, I have no idea what I want to do. So we will talk to you. Well, what do you like about your job? What do you not like about your job? Have you considered this type of a career or have you thought about this type of a role? Some people, I can look at your resume and say, I think you'd be very good at this job. And here's why. And other people will say, I don't like my job. And I want to do something totally different. And we'll say, great. If you want to transition from healthcare into entertainment, that's fine. But let us help you understand how to walk through that in a logical way. Mm. Maybe you're in healthcare and you don't like it, but you do accounting. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe the first step will be to look for an accounting role in an entertainment company. And then from there, maybe the next step is to pivot from accounting into business development. And then maybe from there you go into strategy and then soon you're, you know, an executive in a, at an entertainment company. So it's not really about, I think any transition is possible. It's more about understanding realistically how to pivot yourself so that you can get there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yes, we ha we have a lot of question. What, uh, what should I do after night after graduation? I have no idea. Such kind of question. That's okay. Yeah, that's very that's very normal, and it's it's okay. I it's think part normal. of the next nine months, you will you will learn a lot about yourself, mm -hmm. and you will. Many people, by the time they apply to business school, have a much stronger sense for what they want to do. Thank you. So the next is testing. Yeah, this is, I think, one of the very um, 
large concern name in among Japanese, especially among Japanese applicants. So um, actually, how, um, what, what extent do top school uh, caring about a test score? It's a difficult question to answer. And I think test scores matter. They matter because you are going back to school. And so we need to feel comfortable that you will survive the academic part of the program. However, business school is ultimately about identification and nurturing of leaders. And as we all know, being the leader, a leader within a company is not about your ability to do well on a test. It is about being smart, but it is also about being good with people, having strong communication skills, being very adaptable, being a creative, creative problem solver, and many other things. So when you're applying to a business school, the way to think about it is, if I only have three or four pieces of paper about you, can I see the way in which you excel? What you bring to my program that is that I can't find in anybody else. You are so interesting in this way, or you have such um, a unique experience, or you are clearly so good at what you do. If I see that, then your test score matters much less. But if I see you as very similar to all of the other people from your same company or people from your same industry, then I will use the test score as a way to differentiate because I can't tell the difference otherwise. So I think you want to do as well as you can on the exam, but the test score itself is not going to get you into school and it's also not going to keep you out of school. You can get in with a very low score if you have something very, very interesting to offer. And for everybody, you're going to be somewhere a little bit different on that scale. So you try your best now, but if it, testing is not your thing, that's okay too. Yeah, thank you. So um, this is a very clear uh, explanation about a test score uh, because Japanese applicants tend to uh, to care about test score. I think that we we always say um, the essay and resume and entire your, your application is more important than only the test score. Yes. Thank you. So the next uh, is extracurricular activities. Extracurriculars might uh, be less familiar with uh, Japanese applicants, especially. So if they are applicants who don't have any extracurriculars, they do, um, can they consult with you about extracurricular? Of course. What of course. The start points is, it, um, should the, the extracurriculars are related to their career goal? Do they have? No, their not necessarily. Okay. I, I, again, everything, it really depends on your individual case. Mm -hmm. um, but so, for example, when I lived in Japan, I, I was not from Japan, so I wasn't involved in very many activities, but I loved singing. And mm -hmm. so I joined the choir inside Sony and we would sing at various events. And that's an extracurricular, right? Mm -hmm. So your extracurricular, you may have, extra, you probably have extracurriculars that you're not aware of. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, that's okay too. It's not too late. That's my point is it's better to start now and to have an extracurricular that you've been doing for six, nine, 12 months mm -hmm. than to have zero. Mm -hmm. And I think the difference is that if you're going to start now, you want to think about it strategically. How can I use this in a way that's meaningful? Because I don't have very much time. I don't want to be doing things randomly. We want you to do something you're genuinely interested in. And we want you to do something where you can make a difference. And you don't feel it's just wasting time. That's not what this is about at all. So I, I think that 
as an admissions office, they, they certainly understand that culturally as well, different communities value extracurriculars in different ways. It's not the same everywhere. But that doesn't mean that you're not a really important contributor to whatever community you're in. Okay, thank you. So the next um, is GPA. I have a question uh, about GPA from the audience. So uh, let's move on to that question from the audience. Um, I will read it through, yeah, so in Japanese at first. お話はちょっと、えっと、質問がGPAについてはいただいているので、YouTubeのところから読み上げていきますけれども。お話ありがとうございます。GPAが低い場合、GMATのスコアでどの程度挽回ができますでしょうか。学校により、GPAの重要度は異なりますかということですね。So there is a two questions about the GMAT. Sorry, GPA's GPA. Yeah. So I have, um, if I have a low GPA, um, can higher GMAT score, um, what to what extent can higher GMAT score make up for it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and again, so, sorry. So, sorry, do you want to say the other question as well? Uh, sorry, please. So every, everything that I say is it depends because it, it really is true. Um, I think that if you have a lower GPA, a higher GMAT score is helpful, of course, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it, eliminates your lower GPA because what it shows me is that you're smart, but then why is your GPA low? Do you not take school seriously? Were you lazy? You know, those questions could come up. The truth is for many people, depending upon what your major is, depending upon the college, some schools grading system is very different. And so not every college grades the same. Some schools, nobody gets an A at some schools, everybody gets an A. And the admissions team understands that. So that's why the two together are very helpful. If you have a very high GMAT score and a very low GPA, I know that something happened. Either you had a personal circumstance during undergraduate, or you were in a very difficult major, or you know something. And if you have a very high GPA and a very low GMAT score, then I wonder, were your grades inflated? Did you take only easy classes? Or are you just not very good with standardized testing, which is fine. So that's why all of these things are really looked at holistically, because we understand that one data point does not tell the whole story. And we really want to try and piece that together in, in the way that we see the, the whole picture. Thank you. So the entire balance of your of the application is very important, not only the, the GMAT score or GPA. Yes. And this is why we say in some cases, if you have a very low GPA, then you have a high GMAT score, plus you take a class. Mm. This is a very good way to offset your low GPA. Okay, thank you. So the next uh, question is the school selection from the audience. あ、と学校によって特徴が違うと思いますが、MB、あ、M7に合格したい場合は全ての学校に出願すべきですかと。So uh, every M7 schools has different um different programs, different students, different uh student background. And if I want to uh get into M7, how many schools should I apply to? Mm. The average person applies to somewhere between four and six schools. Mm -hmm. This can be different depending upon your situation. Sometimes people have very low statistics or an unusual circumstance. And so they're taking a little bit more risk and they might apply to more schools. Sometimes people will say, I'm only going to apply to these three schools. And if I don't get in, I don't want to go at all. So my advice 
is that you should apply to a few more schools instead of a few less schools. Because oftentimes, as you're applying, you realize that there are more schools out there that you like than you think. Or you end up getting into a school and getting a scholarship. Or you, some people will get into a school and ultimately decide not to go, but it, they liked having the option. So this is not like university where you apply to 10 schools, 12 schools. That's not necessary. You want to be aware of your strengths and weaknesses and identify a group of schools that allows you to maximize your ability to go to a great school. The M7 are difficult, so I don't necessarily think you're going to apply to all seven. You might apply to three or four of them, and then you might apply to a, a school that's in the top 20, even if you decide not to go. It depends on your profile and, and how much risk that, that involves. Thank you. So the next uh, question is, again, G, G, uh, again test, testing score. Uh, I, I'm also just curious about the test score. How important is GMAT GRE score these days? Because some business schools um, have the test waiver these days. As you may know, uh, for example, Columbia, they uh, do not require TOEFL IELTS, I think, since five years ago so, or so. And some schools, for example, Columbia and I think UCLA and some other schools adopt the executive assessments in addition to GMAT uh, and GRE, which is yeah. easier. Uh, yes, than yes. The previous. So the this is a very uh, difficult question, and it's yeah. one that in the U.S. they discuss a lot, even at the college level. Mm -hmm. So I think testing remains important mm -hmm. because GPA is from school to school to school to school varies so much that it does remain one data point that's consistent across everybody. But there is an effort to, to depressurize it. It's not everything, but it is helpful. Um, I think that the reason that schools have begun to eliminate the, the requirement of TOEFL is because they've decided they can assess English ability in many other ways. So the score itself is not as important. I'm going to interview you. I'm going to read your essays. There are other ways in which I can sort of glean your communication skill. Um, but I, I don't think it's really going to disappear. During COVID, it was made optional. And many of those schools, it no longer have it being optional. They went back to requiring it uh, because they really do find it to be helpful. And I think part of the new GMAT and the new GRE and the shorter exam is in an effort to help make it a bit easier for you. The executive assessment is the part of the reason that the GMAT and the GRE became shorter. The executive assessment has always been a shorter exam intended for people that have been working for so long, it's very difficult to have to go and study again. And yet you're going to school. So we have to have some way of assessing your readiness to attend an academic program. Thank you. Uh, so the next is a this question in Japanese. Harvard no MBA を狙っており、ステイシーさんに相談したいのですが、まずはアルファさんに連絡をすればよいでしょうかということで、えっ、ー、とそうですね。まずはあの私たちに連絡をいただければ、えー、まあステイシーさんもねもちろん、えー、コンサルティングコンサルタントの方たくさんいるんですけど、まず相談いただいてでどういうキャリアアスピレーションなのかとか、どういう志望校なのかとか、伺った上で、カウンセラーの方におつなぎして、で、実際にどういうね、カウンセラーさんとマッチするのかっていうのも、そこから一緒に話していけますので、ぜひご相談ください。So, do you have、um, some evaluation before matching counselor and、uh, the applicants?Yes.、Um, what I will do is to ask Our potential clients to fill out a questionnaire that give me a little bit more information on your background and where you think your strengths and weaknesses are. Some people will come to us and say, I'm not very comfortable talking about myself, 
Or some people will say, I know that I struggle with creative writing. And that helps me to match with a counselor who has that specific skill set. Um, we have many people on our team who've been admissions officers at M7 schools, but we also have many people on our team who have the knowledge of the M7 admissions office because we are all training one another all the time. But perhaps someone who has a skill set in creative writing is a better partner for you at first, and then the admissions perspective comes in later. It, again, it's it's very individual on what will make most sense for you. Thank you. Related to this question, I want to um, know about the difference uh, between Stacey Blackman Consulting and other consulting firm. I know there are extraordinary counselor with former admission experience and also they have, they all, I think they all have MBA degree themselves. So what um, makes different Stacey Blackman? Mm, that's a good question. I think it relates back to our founding that when Stacy founded Stacy Blackman Consulting, there was no other admissions company out there. It didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And so she went personally and met with a head of admissions at different schools and said to them, here's, I see an opportunity to help people that if we can help applicants to present themselves in the most real way and help them understand, please don't focus too much on your job, but tell us more about your life and tell us more about your creativity and all of that. A lot of people don't know that. If we can help them to understand that, that makes your job easier, Wharton. That makes your job easier, Stanford. And all of the business schools said, yes, we agree. That's a great idea. It's not to do anything that is unethical. It's not about that. It's about helping people to express their genuine self. And I think Stacy really did a nice job of building trust with the business schools and making them feel comfortable with it. That if we do our job properly, it's a win-win for everybody. And we now have been doing this for 20 years. And I think that Part of the reason that we have so many former admissions officers on our team is because of our reputation, because they became aware of us when they were in the admissions office and, and sort of respected what we did or um, have gotten to know some of us because we'll pay them a visit over the summer. We will exchange information. We answer questions that they might have about um, what's going on in the marketplace and they are happy to answer our questions about how COVID is affecting admissions, or if a school puts out a new program, then we can go and ask, what is the idea behind this program so that we can advise our clients in the most accurate way? I think the other thing is that we really understand that the key to getting into business school is about being genuine. And it's about expressing who you are as a person, you know, what you believe your strengths and weaknesses are. It's not about faking anything. Mm. It's not about focusing only on statistics or only on job, but really about giving the school a sense of who you are and the kind of leader you'll be and the kind of role model you'll be. And if you can do that effectively, then you're going to be very successful. Thank you. I think nowadays, uh, almost all the applicants use MBA counselors. And um, again, would you recommend them a professional counselor with their MBA application? Do I recommend a professional counselor? So, I mean, so some applicants are not familiar with using professional. I um, see. In their, I see. In their application or in their um, school exam. Mm. I think the advantage to working with an outside counselor, there are a few. I think one is that you have somebody who's very objective. Mm -hmm. Everybody has people in their life that they can ask to help. Friends and family will help. 
but your friends and family know you. And so when they read your resume, they already have the context. They fill in the blanks with their, their knowledge. And an external person will say, I don't understand what this means. Or will say, gee, your resume suggests that you are not a very creative problem solver. Whereas your friend might know you're creative and so they don't actually see that objectively. So I think an objective eye is very, very helpful. The other obvious advantage to working with someone professional is merely that we've gone through this thousands of times, that we have an understanding of what most people look like who are coming out of McKinsey or what many applicants look like that are coming out of this finance company or engineering company or whatever it is, and can help you to identify, oh, this is really unusual or this is really interesting and, and is something that will help you to stand out. And at the same time to say, oh, these are things that are very common. So you don't have to overemphasize that because we already understand that. You know, having that perspective, I think, can be incredibly helpful. I see. So they can get the very professional uh, perspective regarding the application. Okay. So the next question is, how many months do your clients spend on editing essays? Hmm. I mean, that, <laughs> that depends on how strong a writer you are. Um, mm -hmm. It depends on how quickly people work. Some people, if I give them a set of comments, they can very quickly incorporate it and they make tremendous progress. For other people, that's where they struggle and they need a little bit more handholding and maybe we'll go through you know, many more rounds of edits. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Um, I would say that what we, in a perfect world, we would like you to start working on your essays in about June. And that gives you all summer to really develop outstanding applications. Mm -hmm. Like I say, it's not about quantity, it's about quality. I would rather have you submit two applications that are an A plus over five applications that are a B. So having more time enables that, but not everybody needs it. That's very personal. Okay, thank you. So this is a very good timing to start um, preparing, preparing for, I think, 2025 intake. Correct. Yes, now is perfect. Okay. Um, so could a Japanese applicant without high English fluency consult you? I think the, the all the conversation in English, but... Our conversation will be in English. That's primarily because when you, if you want to go to business school in the US, all of your classes will be in English. Mm -hmm. So you need to be comfortable with that. And um, certainly we don't expect you to have perfect English. That's not a requirement, but we will do our sessions in English um, and perhaps it will be good practice. <laughs> yeah, I think very good way to be familiar with using English in your uh, daily life while in Japanese. Ano, えっと、ちょっと日本語で補足すると、日本語あ、英語があまりできないという方いらっしゃるんですけども、まあ、そのためにね、アルファが今回一緒に入ってやるので、あのもちろんカウンセラーの方とは英語でやり取りしてもらうと思うんですけれども、あのまあ、セッション中はね、いろいろなんかツールを使ったりして、なんとか乗り切ってやる。であとはその普通に普段のワードとかを一緒に添削したりっていうのはまあ向こうがね帰って帰ってきたりするのでそれはまあ時間を使って調べながらやり取りしたりするとより英語になれることもできますしあとは単に英語のカウンセラーさんだけとやってるとねこれどういう意味なんだろうとかなかなかこう深,深めるのが難しいと思うんですけども私たちがアルファがいるのでこういうこと言われたんですけどとかこういう指摘を受けたんですけどっていう形でそこにサポートで入ることができるのであの英語はもちろんできた方があのコミュニケーションしやすいと思いますけどパーフェクトじゃなくても全然大丈夫だと思います。はい。Uh, the next question is again about the GPA.、Um, so I heard about that,、uh, the, the average GPA among、uh, the students in the In the US, a very high.、Um, 
the, the average being around 3.8 or so. Uh, I'm from Australia. So how would the GPA in Australian university be evaluated in this context? So the admissions offices are very familiar with different countries having different grading scales. Many countries don't have the concept of a 4.0 scale. Some people are have a 75% or have a first class. And so the admissions office will understand that. They often will ask you to translate your GPA on your own <laughs> to give them a sense, um, but they will be familiar with it and they will also check it against their own knowledge and, and have that scale. Certainly there are plenty of people that apply from Australia and so they are going to be familiar with that. Thank you. Uh, that's all for the question from audience. So I, um, at the end of this section, I will some introduction about the Stacey Brockman and our for collaboration. And uh, at the end of this webinar, I want to ask Sarah to uh, give us some message. So, um, sorry. This, um, yeah, so this is... Uh, part of the, the counselor from Stacey Blackman Consulting. As you see, um, there are many consultants with former MBA admission experience, and you can get an exclusive counselor uh, who is alum and former admission from prestigious school. And if you are really get accepted into top notch schools such as Harvard, Stanford, Kellogg, Warden, and the Columbia, and also other top schools, uh, please feel free to consult with us. You can get uh, extraordinary counseling with such counselors. And there are, are mainly four types of support we are offering. あの、4種類ですね。だいたい今サポートがあるんですけども、で、MBA さっきサラさんのスライドにもありましたけど、これインパクトとかね、とっても大事なので、なんか単純にこう英訳する、ね、今ツールとかありますけど、単純に英訳じゃなくてどういうワードを使うのかとか、どういう順番で書くのかとか
think for everybody, I will say you are in a great position. You are the ones that are doing the right thing because you're thinking about this early. And time in this particular case is a gift. So think about how you can use the next few months to your advantage and then jump in. I think you will be fine. There's many good schools out there and you absolutely can go somewhere great. The more you can do now to think about it, the better off you'll be. And all of us at Stacey Blackman at, and at Alpha are here to help. Thank you very much. I am too very excited about this opportunity. And we are continuing uh, such this kind of video about MBA applications. Yes. Thank you. あの、それでは皆さんご相談したい方をですね、ぜひ、ま、日本語でも全然構いませんので、あの、その